Video recordings of this podcast can be found on RaisingEquity.org and Raising Equity on YouTube. Welcome to Raising Equity. Hopefully you've been following our series on podcasting amidst the pandemic, where we talk to people from different perspectives on how they're navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. Today we have with us Celia Ward-Wallace, and she, along with her husband, have they've opened a cafe in South Central LA where they're able to connect community and be a hub for culture and social activism. And she herself is an internationally recognized expert on women's empowerment. I'm actually a part of her Women Empowering Women community on Facebook and also social entrepreneurship. So I'm really excited that she's here with us today and look forward to hearing her perspective. So thank you for joining us, Celia. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to reconnect. Yeah. So how are you? How are you (laughs) and your family in the midst of everything? Yeah. You know, um, at this moment, I'm doing pretty well. I I feel healthy. I feel strong. I mentally, physically, uh, emotionally, and spiritually strong. Uh, One of your previous podcast guests, a dear friend of mine, and also one of my spiritual mentors, Lindsay Para, always tells me that, you know, one of my blessings is I have extremely uh, strong life force energy, uh, meaning, uh, you know, my body really works for me. My energy really works for me. And I I generally um, run very on the healthy side. So, so far, so good. And and yet, like, I think everybody in this moment in time, you know, it's like every minute of every day is different. And, you know, our emotions are all over the place. And depending on how much uh, information you take in at, at what time of the day, whether you've gotten a walk in, whether you've, you know, gotten enough food, y- you feel you feel differently. And so everybody I'm talking to, including myself, is expressing, you know, today was a great day. T- today was a terrible day. You know, to, to th- at this moment, I feel good. But this morning when I woke up, I felt really depressed or I felt really anxious. So definitely, um, I am also experiencing all the ebbs and flows. But in this moment right now, I'm feeling pretty strong in my body and in my spirit and just excited to be with you. I'm glad to hear that. I can imagine I feel similarly like I'm, I can be all over the place. And I can feel like I've got this. We've got a rhythm. We're doing this thing that we've never done before. And then the next moment, I feel tearful or anxious or right. And so I think it's I I appreciate you sharing that honestly because I think sometimes people feel like uh, if we're not grounded all the time and you know have done our meditation and yoga and mm. whatever and like we don't have it together that that we're not doing it right and to remind ourselves that we've never done this before. And so, here yeah, we are. I feel like, you know, we're we're in the moment of sort of this great pivot. Uh, this is a moment in time where everything we knew before, uh, all, all, honestly, in a lot of ways, we need to release uh, because we are literally in the stages of creating what will become our new normal. And yet we don't know what that's going to be and we don't know when that's going to happen and we don't know what it's going to look like. And so everything that we've done before may not be relevant at all in where we're going. Uh, and so it, it is very unsettling and confusing and and in, in the midst of both this you know financial crash and for those of us who are in entrepreneurship potentially, you know, business is closing or having to create a completely different, you know, source of livelihood, people getting laid off, uh, fear over health, uh, you know, we're at the same time, you know, being asked to make sense of it all. And I think right now, it, you know, it's just one of those things. There's so much uncertainty and and people are not comfortable living in the gray area and the not knowing. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like that's part of the silver lining of this is, you know, us really getting to um, a place where we can be at peace with be- not knowing what's going to happen and realizing that there are most of everything is out of our control in life in general. And, you know, in some ways, this is a time of a great reset and a re- great rebirth. And, you know, while this is scary and of course, many lives are being lost and uh, there's a lot going on on the health front and economic front. At the same time, there's a lot of innovation and transformation and uh, rebirth available for all of us. And so uh, on the positive, optimistic side, I look at this as as a time where, you know, a lot of the structures that we're not serving, a lot of the structures that were not equitable, 
are going to be re-examined and potentially crumble or be rebuilt. Uh, and those of us who who stay in the game and you know are willing to push through the discomfort will also potentially be the leaders and the voices that are going to help reshape what the the new normal or the the world that we we are building for the future and what that will become. And you're you're reminding me. I mean, your whole background is in entrepreneurship, and so part of what I wanted to talk about is like how the cafe is doing and how you've had to pivot as a business that that was just starting to get its feet, right? And then in just sharing right there, you reminded me, oh wait, you've been you've been doing this thing called entrepreneurship for a long time. And so I imagine I that mindset and that framework has helped you pivot. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, and just to look at that, just to say, you know, my background comes out of um, community organizing. So, you know, my family for multiple um, uh, generations has a deep seated legacy and in particular um, anti-racism, anti-racist work, as well as women's liberation work, as well as, you know, sort of uh, anti-imperialism work. And, and so when I grew up, um, my parents were full-time community organizers, full-time uh, labor union organizers, and have, uh, you know, I was really embedded in a life of critical uh, analysis of uh, America, of our, of our social structures, of um, inher- the inherent, you know, racism, classism, uh, patriarchy, imperialism that is a part of this country that we all are a part of. And so I have been examining the the issues that people are, you know, even now, like we say, post-Trump 2016, but let's say even now more than ever, for anybody who didn't wake up in 2016, everybody on the planet right now is waking up uh, in, you know, COVID-19. And because of that, there's this great illumination, this veil has been um, lifted where now we're seeing, you know, wow, uh, all of these so-called, um, you know, structures within our government or within our our way of, of society are actually so flawed and are actually so weak and are actually could crumble within a week, right? You know, most people don't have $400 saved to, you know, make it even through a week. And so now people are finally starting to look at that. While these are things that, you know, in my family's tradition, we examine, analyzed and been critical of and try to create innovative uh, strategies through community organizing and um, leadership uh, to, to work against those flaws in the systems. And yet, um, and then in addition to that, uh, from 20, 20 years on, I have been a full, a full-time entrepreneur with either a side hustle or for the last, uh, 10 years, I've been leading my own coaching and consulting firm, specifically working on innovation and so- social enterprise businesses and brands and entrepreneurs that want to have social impact and want to change the world. And so, uh, this is not new to me. This, a lot of ways for, a lot of people, I feel like they feel like this is like a destiny moment. This is like, you know, the peak of why they feel like they're on the planet. And so I very much feel like that's part of what I'm living right now is this like, you were made for this. And uh, if any, as well as with my husband, you know, it, who's my partner, but like, if anybody could do this, could figure it out, could make it through, could, um, you know, lift their voices up, could be the voice of the voiceless, um, could fight on behalf of the most vulnerable. Uh, it, it could be me, it could be my husband, it could be our families um, and our community members. Uh, and just to say, um, as far as the, the innovation, as well, you know, we, we, like I said, we've had businesses or side hustles um, since 1997. Uh, of, and my husband before that, my husband is a lifelong entrepreneur, um, uh, raised up by, um, you know, he's African American from South Central, raised up by a single mom who uh, was a lifelong entrepreneur as well. And so it's very much in his blood. His blood is on the entrepreneur side. My blood is on the community organizing side. And when we met, we combined both of our um, legacies and passions and purposes to create this sort of social enterprise, you know, uh, 
um, how to create, um, how to, how to make profit and combine it with purpose, you know, how to create businesses that have social impact, uh, and community focus. And, and in particular for the most marginalized and most, uh, uh, under sourced communities, but all of that to say, uh, our previous business was a, a part of the real estate business when, um, you know, that, that big real estate boom that happened, but we also were completely wiped out in the 2008 crash, uh, and recession. And so we have, uh, we literally were wiped out. You know, we f- foreclosed on properties. We faced bankruptcy. We had terrible credit. We had no income. My husband lost his job. Um, you know, I uh, that that is actually a time where I had a massive spiritual awakening, and it's actually part of what um, brought great levels of innovation for me then in in 2018, uh, where I that launched me into my new career um, as you know a leader, as a coach, as a mentor mentor as a speaker and writer and all of that. Um, but all of that to say we faced really rock bottom and we, we went through that dark, dark time into a, a two, totally new path in life into, um, uh, purpose-driven and, and light life, you know, uh, legacy making work for the last decade And so now, yes, we created South LA Cafe in November of 2019, and we spent um, 14 months prior to that building it and building our community and our following. And we opened up to massive levels of success and we can get into the the business and all that. But we also have been through uh, something very similar to what we're in right now. And what happened in the other crash that is similar to now is we weren't in it alone. Uh, and so what I know to be true is this is going to be a story that we can all tell and that we will all know, we'll all have our shorthand, you know, way of like, oh yeah, you know, like you barely even need to say anything and, you know, people will know, um, you know, either, um, you know, someone lost their life or someone, you know, or I was really sick or, you know, we lost our house or we lost our business or, you know, whatever. We're all going to have the stories of this time. And we're also all going to have the stories of how uh, we rebuilt ourselves and how we were reborn and how we, uh, you know, really became innovative and created um, new things in this time. And so that's, that's what we've been able to do. We've been able to do what I'm sort of calling this great pivot of, you know, uh, a hard, a hard pause on what happened before, and then uh, a hard reset on what's going to happen moving forward. And and there are many things that we've done that are innovative as well. I think that sets up nicely um, the the call to all of us that are going through, like you said, it's there is there's going to be shorthand. So many ways in which people are impacted. Uh, their jobs, their their lives, the how they relate to their children, right? But what your what your story reminds me of is that we have to remember that we can draw on our past experiences. That even yeah. though we've never been here before, we've been places like this, perhaps very similar, or perhaps just that have taught us about what we're made of and what we need to draw on at times like this. And uh, I think that's. I think that's I think that's important to remind us. I as I was preparing for this interview, I was thinking, gosh, it would be really hard to have birthed this this baby, this idea that really was when I I remember when you were talking about it on the Women Empowering Women um site, like it sounded it sounded exciting. It sounded like a perfect marriage yeah. within your marriage. Of taking, you know, creating this hub, being anti gentrification, like responding rather than waiting for someone else to to offer something in the community in a food desert, like we're going to offer it. I was excited for you, and so yeah. there was a piece of me that, like, real, real, legit, was like sad when when I was thinking about all the friends that I have that are small business owners. Yeah. I have some friends here in St. Louis, similarly. Like, oh, I just hope they can make it through. Right. Mm -hmm. But you, your story, even right now is reminding me that like, y'all will make it through. Like who knows if it'll look like what it looked like. And, you know, like I, like I say, or have said to our followers, um, and, and at some point I know we'll get into some of the, the pivots and innovative strategies that we've come up with. Cause I do think there's, um, 
some wisdom and insights that I think your listeners could could glean from hearing how we navigated it. But what I have told um, people is, you know, the cafe as a brick and mortar is a container. It uh, it is a a space that holds the ideas, that holds the souls, that holds the innovation, and yet all of that can live outside of the cafe. Uh, and so, you know, uh, no 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 physical space is going to limit the potential and the legacy and the impact that we're on the planet to to provide. And so, of course, we want to hold on to our space. Of course, we want our so-called business to survive and thrive. And yet at the same time, the cafe was just a container to hold the vision. The vision is larger. The purpose is larger. The, the mission uh, for us on the planet is way beyond any particular space in time. Uh, and so I think that we know that um, we're being called to lead. We are being called to um, step forward. And I think everybody who is listening to this and everybody really on the planet, this is a time of deep, deep self-reflection. Uh, if if you are not actively battling, you know, health issues at this time, I, I would say, you know, and, and I've been hearing people say, uh, you know, oh, this is so great. You know, we're finding time to reconnect and, you know, we're getting back to the basics and all of that. And I know there's some been some backlash of that, like, you know, sort of like, don't do spiritual bypassing. Like, don't be like, oh, everything's so great. I just love being at home and I have more time with my kids when there's a real health issue and people are dying. But at the same time, I think that it would be too, um, it would be remiss to not take in the the beauty and the lessons that are being learned from the slower pace. Like for me, I am finding that um, being at home uh, with my children and them not having to hop up and rush in the morning, us hop up and rush, you know, that rush energy that I didn't get enough sleep. Nobody got enough sleep. And yet we're rushing out the door. Um, the, the bickering, the, you know, not enough time to wash a dish, you know, not enough time barely to make a, a proper meal, running out the door, picking them up, racing off to the soccer field, you know, uh, you know, making sure they're getting their homework done. Like just, you know, and then in between all of that, right, working, running a cafe, running to get the groceries, making sure I have everything stocked, you know, just that like go, go, go energy that uh, on American society in, in particular has been built on. Um, and yet I know globally is an issue as well. I think the fact that now we're having this like hard pause of like, stay home, you know, look at yourself, you know, look at the life that you've created, you know, uh, get back to, you know, cleaning up your house, you know, get back to making a real meal, uh, you know, get back to a slower pace uh, and potentially more sleep. And then within that, the opportunity for the self-reflection of, you know, this, this conversation. And I'm, as I'm looking out the window, I'm seeing uh, a fire truck going down the block. And so I, I just do want to say, I, you know, we are actively in the midst of a pandemic here in South Central, as we all are across the country, there are people right now calling for ambulances. So I just do want to say that that part is very real. And yet at the same time, this, the self-reflection on, um, you know, why am I here on the planet? Uh, you know, what matters the most in this conversation about essential and non-essential it's, it's been used in the context of businesses, you know, or like if you go out of the house, the only thing you can do is go for these essential services. Um, but at the same time, I think it's very illuminating as a concept of, you know, at the end of the day, what are we finding is actually essential and non-essential in our lives? Right now, most of us are mainly focusing on what we would consider the essential things, right? You know, health and safety and welfare of ourselves and our community, um, the, the, our children, 
you know, making it through this time, trying to protect them, trying to inform them, trying to make sure they continue with life as best as we can um, and that they have a sense of normalcy, uh, you know, connecting with our partners or our loved ones who are in the home and making sure everybody's getting what they need. Uh, and then building building a home, right? Building a home life, like, you know, if we're going to be at home, what does it mean to be, what is a home? What does it mean to be in your home? Uh, if you do end up having extra time, which a lot of people do, how do you choose to spend that time? What actually really matters to you? Uh, and so I think that there's, even even for people who are not thinking about this through a career or um, business reinvention or innovation, there is the the rebirth and innovation of your soul, of your purpose, of, of your impact in the world, and, and really the life, the way that you want to live it. And so that part to me feels very fertile, uh, very exciting, and very optimistic. And I think it's important to also raise up that it doesn't have to be uh, some major accomplishment, right? Like you said, just to be able to reflect, because I've also heard people say, you know, you don't have to come out of the pandemic with a new revenue stream or a completely (laughs) new way of life. It's like, no, you don't have to, but you're right in this pause. Like what are, how do we align with how we want to be? Yeah. I do want to say that. I do want to temper that because I, I, I am like, we all have archetypes and sort of blueprints, right. In terms of sort of, I I believe in terms of like our soul path and like, what are we here to do? And, you know, what are, what are our personalities and what are our blueprints and what are our our gifts? And this is a lot of what I do in my coaching and my programs is helping people sort of unearth that and then figure out what they can do with it. And what I like to say is that your purpose does not have to be a career. Your purpose does not have to be um, a revenue stream. Your purpose can be, you know, to spread love. Your purpose can be to, um, you know, teach teach people about the importance of like, you know, eating good meals or, you know, uh, it could be about realizing that like music is a, a, a way, a pathway to like freedom. Like it could be, you know, about like, oh, I really realize that I'm here to be a part of my family and like, you know, building a strong family or reconnecting with my husband and like really focusing on my family is what's mattering to me right now. So purpose does not have to be like, sometimes it gets so grandiose and feels like, you know, especially sometimes I feel like I I carry this responsibility to clarify because I am built for world changing leadership. I've known that since, you know, the minute I could talk, my mom always told me, you know, we're going to have to figure out what career path you go into that can handle your power, that can handle your bigness. And it's, it's been something that I've had a journey with my whole life. So not everybody has the blueprint that I do. Um, but whether it's making literal shifts within yourself, um, or in the way you interact with the people in your household or the way you interact with your neighbors, that in itself is doing the work. Uh, and if every single person right now that isn't actively dealing with health issues um, can be doing just little bits of their personal and spiritual work to just help them, um, you know, when I when I say sort of rebirth, I just mean rebirth into, you know, what's the 2.0 version of you? And then if you get there and we're still hanging out at home and you got a slower pace, what's the 3.0 version of you? You know, it doesn't have to be that, you know, you were, you were doing whatever before and now you've come up with some revolutionary world changing technology or you know right, or you become a, a, a online celebrity or something like that right yeah no I appreciate that clarification um so let let's go there I, I want to yeah. hear the innovation that you've brought to this time because knowing you I know that it will be useful to listeners Yeah, for sure. And if it's okay, I just want to give a few minutes of background so that people understand the context of what is South LA Cafe? Why does it matter? Why is it more than just a coffee shop or a cafe space? I love Uh, the mission. So I, you know, I was reading the mission to build community through coffee, culture and connection. Beautiful. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Yeah, so absolutely. Yes, please do so share So Joe and I are long-term residents of South Central Los Angeles. I know that your audience is all is global. And so just to say, if you've heard of South LA or South Central LA, most people have seen it on TV um, and their perception of it is it's this dangerous place that, you know, predominantly Black people live and there's also gangs and, you know, lots of conflict with police and, you know, that kind of stuff is usually what I hear people say, you know, a lot of rappers come out of the area and um, there's a lot of drug addicts or something like that. You know, that's the way that like the negative misperception of our community has been portrayed for many, many, many years. Um, And I like for people to really understand that um, South Central Los Angeles is actually um, located right in the center of the city in one of the most uh, desirable parts of Los Angeles. Uh, and if you go back to the early 1900s, this was a predominantly all white neighborhood. Uh, and when you talk about the great migration um, and t- a time when a lot of African American uh, families came from other places in the country to California and to other places that were um, starting to have lots of opportunities for jobs and and the rise of the manufacturing uh, sector of factories where they needed workers and there was actually the opportunity to make a really good wage regardless of your level of education. Uh, There was a rise of uh, African-American families that came to Los Angeles and other places. And then at that time, there was um, something in place called redlining um, and that basically made it where those families could only live in certain neighborhoods and can only buy houses in certain neighborhoods. And as uh, a few families started to move into South Central uh, as, as well as other places throughout um, the country. There was this phenomenon called white flight, uh, where it was a predominantly white neighborhood that when Black families started being able to buy houses in this community, uh, you know, sort of overnight, the 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 um, real estate agents and developers would tell the white families, you know, if you don't move now, if you don't sell your house now, you know, look at what's happening. All these black people are coming in here and this, your house is not going to be worth anything. So you need to sell quickly. Right. And so very rapidly, um, there was this white flight phenomenon. Also, they started building up houses specifically in the suburbs uh, that were were zoned basically and were not were in this red redlining uh, situation were not available to people that were not white. And so they started creating suburbs for the white people. And so the urban centers, the city centers were considered less desirable. And I know you cover all of this in your podcasts and people who follow you can learn it even better from you. But it's important for people to understand that then this became a predominantly black neighborhood. And for many, many years, this was a, or for even decades, this was a thriving uh, black a city center community full of black families, um, people who were employed, people who had homes. The homes here are beautiful. They're they're hundred year old homes, uh, and and you know black business. Uh, we also live right near Central Avenue. Central Avenue in South Central was. Uh, essentially like what what Harlem was in, um, you know, the renaissance of, you know, the jazz renaissance and the music renaissance in Harlem we had here in Los Angeles. And that was on Central Ave, which is one of our main thoroughfares in South Central Los Angeles. So Ella Fitzgerald and, you know, all of the like amazing um, music was happening on Central Ave. Again, this was a thriving community. Uh, And of course, still within the constraints of systemic racism and, you know, capitalism and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, But to, and then we had, um, you know, all of those factories started to close, right? People started to lose their jobs at the same time. Uh, It's debated of how this started, but essentially uh, crack cocaine was introduced into our communities. Uh, There became a rampant, uh, you know, addiction to drugs uh, and selling drugs in in our community. At the same time, there became a rise of uh, uh, 
gang, gang, you know, gang life and gangs, uh, violence at the same time. There also then became a overreaction to all of that, uh, through, uh, Clinton's, you know, crime bill and uh, other, other initiatives, the three strikes law, uh, where th- we started having a over, uh, oversaturation of police force, um, and policing of what, of the black community, uh, and people becoming uh, a part of the prison industrial system. And so, uh, and a lot of people getting locked up for very small crimes that then became their third strike, and then they would get, you know, life in prison. And uh, all of this to say that once what what was once a white neighborhood then became a black neighborhood where white people didn't want to be a part of it, then became um, a disenfranchised community uh, where people started stopped investing in the community. Then there was this, uh, you know, crack issue, drug issue, policing issue. Then we had the uprising uh, where uh, after the Rodney King verdict, where the community responded in outrage uh, and, you know, basically started taking it out on their neighborhood because this is where they live. And, you know, so we had a lot of businesses closed. We had a lot of businesses burned down. Uh, and that that was sort of the peak of when South Central uh, L.A. was thought of as, you know, like this super ghetto area that nobody would want to have anything to do with. And, you know, everybody there was like these terrible people. And, you know, everything that you see on TV is super violent and you can't step foot in there without getting killed. And like nobody would want to put any money into that community. And so since that time, which was, you know, in the early 90s, uh, we've continued with a, a, a really, really, really high level of policing, a lot of police brutality, uh, what they call a school to prison pipeline, where there's policing in the schools, uh, where for small things like, you know, um, being truant to class, you know, they're starting to give t- kids tickets or they're starting to, you know, put kids essentially into the um, uh, p- uh, prison, si- not, not prison system, but the school to prison pipeline, where they start to track them as problem children, uh, give them more and more issues. And eventually they start getting them into, you know, jail. And what you're seeing also is they're giving out tickets on schools, on buses for the smallest things that then parents need to come to the courts to deal with. But because parents can't take the days off because most of them are laborers or working two jobs, they, they then, um, get, you know, fines on those tickets and eventually they get warrants for their arrest. And so you're getting a lot of people in the jail system who are in there for like the smallest little issues that it first started with, but because they can't afford to pay for the fines, they are getting in the system that way as well. And so all of that to say, this area has been thought of, uh, it is now over 50% Latino. That's the other thing that I want to say is this is a black and brown community. Um, as far as immigration, um, both both documented and undocumented, this is definitely a center uh, area where we've had tons and tons of people coming into the community. So we have over the years, there's also been tension between uh, Latinos and Blacks, but there's also a lot of harmony and a lot of love between the two communities as well. Uh, it's, com- it's complex, like many things are. But all of that to say, this has been a community that has a very, very rich history, um, a very complex history, and lots of people here with tons and tons of resilience who have been through a lot who have seen a lot, uh, who have not been given a lot. And so this is a community where there has not been since the, you know, late 80s, early 90s, really any economic investment in the community. And when we saw over the last um, five to 10 years, this like crazy, like peak in the real estate um, and the stock markets, what ended up happening as a phenomenon, not just here in Los Angeles, but all throughout the country is uh, people who have a lot of money, uh, you know, we're starting to buy up the real estate. We're starting to take, you know, the most desirable neighborhoods, also inflating the the price to the cost of living and the price to buy. Uh, so people who carry a lot of privilege uh, who maybe have some level of um, generational wealth or inherited wealth or parents that have some money that can help them, uh, were, they themselves were starting to get priced out of what we would call the West Side uh, or the more affluent neighborhoods. And so what started to happen was they they started creeping their way closer and closer to the non-desirable neighborhoods. And when they finally um, discovered uh, South Central again, uh, you know, almost, almost 
75 years since they left, uh, they decided that now this was, you know, a, a, a newly discovered up and coming neighborhood. And so um, it, just yeah. to be clear, it sounds like most of these folks were white. Like you're talking about the yeah. general wealth, generational wealth and those who, yeah, like you mentioned, the blockbusting and their parents had fled. They now are coming back and, like you said, discovering this neighborhood. They're coming anew. back and they're discovering it. And now that the houses are now seven hundred, eight hundred thousand, some in our in our what we call like our Black Beverly Hills area, or like a million dollars to them, that still seems affordable. Because if you go to the West Side, you know it's one point five million, two million for something comparable. Because we actually have really big houses here. Like I, I have a five bedroom craftsman home that's 2,500 square feet that's built in 1907 that we bought many, 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 many years ago for uh, almost less than $300,000, right? But now my home technically is worth 800,000, you know, 900,000. And if I needed the money or if I thought I, I, you know, this was my chance to sell, I would sell now. But what we're having, what we've had is these poachers, like these um, real estate companies that are basically trying to buy as many houses as possible, flip them as quickly as possible, bring in new tenants, and and basically they're rapidly shifting the demographic of the neighborhood uh, where, you know, white families primarily are the ones coming in from the West Side um, and and buying the homes. But it's not even that. It's that along our thoroughfares, like we have Crenshaw Boulevard, which is one of our most notorious, you know, famous South Central streets. We also have Figueroa. Uh, both of those, Figueroa is coming up on the USC side. And so where USC is, is they've basically built, and bought and built, you know, USC housing and developments all the way, like almost like almost like a full mile of blocks of all USC development. And uh, and with that, they've started to finally bring in things that like we haven't been able to have grocery stores in our community because supposedly, um, you know, our neighborhoods are too dangerous and the poor people here don't want fresh produce and aren't going to invest and buy it, they think. And so we haven't been able to have actual like we don't have Ralph's, we don't have Trader Joe's, we don't have any Whole Foods, anything like that, that you might or Sprouts, anything like that. We have sort of what they would consider like a, a B or C level grocer that is having, you know, less less good food, a lot of packaged food. Um, and, but all of that to say development ar- along um, Figueroa and then Crenshaw has seen this, you know, all this commercial development and what that, between starting to see all of these, you know, white people out walking their dogs and, you know, like all of the open houses being, you know, non, non black and brown faces, uh, and, and, and us living here in the midst of it, we just felt like, you know, the writing was on the wall that this community is rapidly changing and we may not be able to do anything to stop it. Uh, but what we can do is try to put a stake in the ground and say, we were here, and we will be here and we will create a space that is centered on the black and brown folk that have been here and create a space where they can come and gather and feel welcome and feel like it was for them by them. Uh, and, and so South LA Cafe was born out of an anti-gentrification effort, as well as a response to a food desert issue where people cannot get access to actual fresh, affordable, and healthy food. And so we started the cafe as a space to bring people in, but once they were in, allow them to feel welcome, create a really high-end, beautiful space that was very much what you would see on the West Side, but also have all of these um, sort of insider things uh, wink, wink kind of moments that it's like, this is very much for our people because like, oh, we have like a Nipsey Hussle mural in our conference room. Uh, we have, uh, literal f- photographs by local South Central based photographers that are all of the different intersections and famous, um, monuments in South Central. So like, if you walk in and you're not from the community, you might look at that and say, oh, that's really cool, but it's not going to mean anything to you. But we have people who come in every day and they look and they say, um, you know, oh my God, you know, like that's the church on my corner or, you know, that's the ice cream truck guy that like drives by every day, you know, and it makes people feel like this is for me. Well, you're reflecting, you're reflecting them back to themselves, right? Like, so they see themselves reflected in, like you said, whether it's the, the, um, Nipsey Hussle or the, the, picture of the intersection or like you said there are these ways in which 
they get reflected back that they matter, that that they're there yeah. and that they're represented. Yeah. And that's powerful. I, it is powerful. And on, on the pre-COVID innovation tip, we also created a brand, a, like a clothing line and a product line that is all based around, you know, South LA Cafe. And one of the reasons we created that name uh, and the way that our logo is, is like big block print South LA and then a little, you know, cafe word underneath it that's very secondary. And part of the vision for that, again, was about the reclaiming of the narrative of that sense of pride of, you know, we love South Central. We love South LA. We're from here. We're of it. We believe in the magic of the people here. And we want to claim it and rep it like with that level of pride and make it a cool thing. And so our product line has just basically gone crazy because people um, feel it. They want that too. They The people who are from here feel proud about it right. and they want a way to express that. They want to represent uh, and, where yeah. they're from. Yeah. And I I actually have never been to L.A. and <laughs> But I have a few friends that are from there and in my little bit of reading part of when you were talking about some of the narrative and the stereotypes people have, um, you know, I had heard all those narratives, but one of the things I learned and, and I'd be curious your thoughts is, you know, we hear a lot about the gangs, right. But from my reading, it seems like that, oh, that gangs were actually a way to protect the community. Like that there was a piece of that was a, it was in response to the over policing. And it reminded me of kind of with the black Panthers, how we often just get the narrative of black Panthers being, violent or gung toting. It's like, well, no, they actually were serving the community and you were triggered by the fact that they were black people who were speaking to black power and carrying guns, which they had the right to. So it, it, when you were mentioning just some of the story, I was thinking history that how complex is it? And, and, yes. and, and the ways in which like some of those stories um, don't get heard and the dynamic, I know it was like a two minute version, which I totally appreciate you sharing with us, but like the, the way in which the, the, those flashpoints and the history of South LA um, in and of themselves, like I want to know more. I want to, it, it's making me want to go back and, and read more and understand the history. And, and it's very, it is very complex and there's lots of contradictions. That's the, you know, sort of the yes. story of my life. And I think that for all of us to understand that it isn't black and white. I mean, yes. it, obviously we're talking about race, but in that case it's black and white. But in terms of the story or the story of any community, of any neighborhood, of any person, you know, there's so much gray area, there's so much unknown, uh, and there's so much more dimension to it than, you know, we, we want everything to fit into a box. You know, we want to be able to say what's bad and what's good. You know, uh, you know, kids going to school is good. Kids being in a gang is bad. You know, but it's like, as as they say, you know, with most disease, it's like, do you treat for the symptoms or do you treat for the root cause? And I think that the thing that um, was happening before COVID, but I think is being even greater now is that illumination of, um, you know, let's look at the root causes, you know, and that's where it's messy. And that's where it's the dirty work lies. And that's where um, really the complexity lies because it's a lot of illumination on how much privilege so many people are carrying. And if they want things to be different, if they truly want to make an impact, they have to be willing to examine that privilege and, and unpack the privilege and figure out how to leverage the privilege uh, to, you know, make social change. And that part is uncomfortable. And that part is messy. And it means you have to be able to give something up. And that part, most people don't want to do, right? They want to stay safe and they want to stay in their box and they want to live the life that they want to live. And so with South LA Cafe, that's part of what we, our challenge to the community was, is you can keep going, 10 more blocks down, you know, any direction and go to a Starbucks. Uh, and so, and you, you've probably been doing that, you know, three, four or five times a week, or you can maybe go five more minutes out of your way, you know, spend 50 cents more uh, and go to a South LA cafe and essentially just make a conscious political decision that you're going to put your dollars behind your values and that you're going to invest in a local family owned, minority owned um, business that, you know, has a social movement behind it and is here to serve the community. And if that matters to you, which so much, so many of us talk about what matters to us, but when it comes to making the decisions that actually back up 
those those um, ideas, it does sometimes take sacrifice. And when it comes down to that, a lot of times people want to take the easy way out or, you know, just, you know, hey, I'm running late. I'm just going to go where I want to go. Well, what would it look like to say, I'm going to make sure that I put an extra 15 minutes in my, you know, day so that I can go and I can make sure that this, um, you know, family stays in business and that, you know, they, I might not be ready to do, um, you know, the grassroots community organizing work, but they're doing it or they're supporting people who are doing it. And therefore by supporting them, ultimately I'm getting what I want, even if I can't do it myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so has that continued in the midst of COVID-19, like you all being that community hub? Are you seeing people make the conscious decision to remain in community and find ways to be connected? together. Yeah. But not. Yeah. And I'm going to respond to that and also sort of blending your previous question about what we've done that's innovative. Um, and so what absolutely, and, and because we've been through this before, as far as a, a crash and because I'm like a podcast junkie, um, you know, I had been tracking what was happening in the other countries with COVID from day one. Uh, and I started giving my husband, Joe, who's also my business partner, I started giving him sort of a heads up, bite-sized pieces as it was coming down the pipeline. And of course, like a lot of people at first, you know, he sort of was like, you know, are you being alarmist, you know, or are you being paranoid or like, you know, don't be so doomsday and all that kind of stuff, which initially I was feeling frustrated about because I really felt like I had a lot of clarity um, and I was actually pioneering, you know, and, and I really wanted to make sure that, you know, we were lock in step with it. But at the same time, uh, as, as Lindsay Para, who I mentioned earlier, helped, helped me to understand, you know, at first, you know, she was like, you know, it's a lot to take in and it's, it's, it, you know, it can be very scary for a lot of people. And so not everybody's ready to see it uh, yet. And, and luckily, you know, he, he, he moved through that pretty quickly and we started to become a great team very quickly. And, and we were able to uh, start to do not hoarding per se, but, you know, start to get the things that we knew we were going to need as far as um, sanitizing, uh, as far as PPEs, um, uh, as far as st- uh, inventory for the cafe pretty early on before they started to flag everybody, you know, once they did the big, you know, announcement, then everybody went racing. And I'd say we were about three or four weeks prior to that already planning for it. I started telling my staff very early on that this was coming. I didn't know what it was going to look like for them, but that there was a potential that their hours might be cut back. There might be layoffs to make sure they were taking great care of their health and also saving their money um, as much as possible. Of course, most of our staff um, are locally local hires, um, Um, young people of color, uh, people who are living paycheck to paycheck. So telling them to save their money, you know, is, is a harder, you know, harder than, than, than you might think. But at the same time, we were giving them heads up. We also um, began social distancing very quickly. Uh, We removed tables from our cafe so that all the tables were over six feet apart. Uh, We, we already were doing, you know, a lot of cleaning, but we just really enhanced all of that. We started using gloves very quickly um, for everything. We were already using gloves for the food prep or for everything we were using gloves. And then when um, Gavin Newsom, our our mayor of, or our governor of California, went to the stay at home order and also then uh, went for all not uh, for all non-essential businesses they needed to close and for essential businesses which were we were considered since we serve food we needed to go to a um, takeout only option uh, we very quickly pivoted we also do have a market which I didn't mention but we also have South LA market which was a, literally a little mini market where you can get fresh produce um, and yet since it's so small uh, it really is not was not re- on a responsible level a a safe place to be bringing people in and so instead we shifted for the market to be our place where we held inventory and where we did our prep uh, and sort of our ground zero station and from there we would take over to the cafe anything that we were going to then be serving or offering to the community and so uh, we took one day off when that order came through uh, to do takeout only because we had not yet we were only four months in 
And so we had not yet set up our online ordering, you know, options and all that. But very quickly, um, we launched an app in 24 hours. Uh, we created, uh, we partnered with a company that is called the Joe Coffee App, which is funny because my husband's name is Joe, and obviously we're selling coffee, so it was a, it was a match made in heaven. Uh, and very quickly, we were able to essentially launch this app that you know people, um, if you're listening and you watch on it, you just text the word coffee, uh, C-O-F-F-E-E to this phone number, which is 474747. And once you text it, it comes down to your phone, you open it up, um, you can place your order. And on there, you can even say you want um, curbside delivery. And essentially, that would be contactless um, takeout. So you place your order, we get the order on our end, we place the order, and then we get a honking horn saying that you've arrived we bring it out to your car with our mask and gloves on and you just take it and you're on your way. So that was one thing that shifted immediately. But I do have to say our sales are down 80%. Uh, so revenue has dropped 80%, which obviously is very significant. Uh, also for a, a new business, uh, we we opened and were um, profitable from day one. Uh, and we were growing 10% every month that we were open in our overall revenue. So we were still on our upward um, descent. Is that the right word? Um, ascent. 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 Yep. Um, and so, and people were already, you know, coming out of the woodwork, you know, this is a great business model. You know, this is a revolutionary concept. We were already thinking about future locations. And uh, so going down to 80% revenue, and we have had to lay off um, a significant amount of our staff temporarily. Uh, and so uh, a couple other things I just want to say really quickly that were innovative is we also immediately leveraged our relationships with that we had already built with our local government. Uh, and so we called both the mayor's office and the council member's office, our, our contacts there, again, really early on and said, this is going to happen. It's going to have a huge impact on us and our community. What are your plans? And please make sure that you keep us at the top of the list for anything that's coming as far as relief or opportunities. And we actually, I, I was actually able both with, with the council office and the mayor's office to be play an instrumental role in helping them develop the different relief options that they created uh, and basically became a, a non-paid <laughs> consultant uh, and strategist for, for the different ideas that they were coming up with and giving them feedback directly from our perspective. And so we did partner with the, our local council member's office. Um, that's Marquise Harris Dawson from Council District 8 in Los Angeles. And we helped with them uh, collaborate on what they're calling the emergency senior meal program, which essentially they were able to get um, uh, funds that had been allocated for a different purpose released. And they have now hired 20 different food service, uh, local food service restaurants to prepare, cook and prepare meals and then actually do delivery um, to seniors that were encouraging to stay home uh, so that they, again, in its contactless delivery, you know, gloves and masks and bags delivering to the door. Uh, but we are now getting paid to do that for over 100 meals a week. And so that has helped bridge the gap on some of the income issues. And then there's one other thing I just want to say is we also went to crowdfunding. Uh, and so we really put back on our community again, the challenge of, you know, we've been here for you and now we need you to be here for us. And if you, if, if what we do matters and has impacted you, your life, uh, and you want us to be around and you want us to be here on the other side of this, we need your help right now. And so Joe was very adamant of, he wanted to do a three month campaign, essentially challenging people to make a, do a donation for three months as a sustainer for us over a three month period, as little as 10 dollars a month as much as you want after that uh, but essentially you would commit to signing up as a supporter and you would say I will do ten dollars a month and for the next three months we would receive ten dollars from you uh, and so we created this campaign and and when I say he was adamant about it being for three months uh, he really wanted um, yes we need your support uh, but at the same time he didn't want something that was ongoing we're not trying to ask for your help forever 
forever and ever. Like we're, we have plans to rebuild and get ourselves back on our feet. And it's not it, what we didn't want it to be linked with the program or a service. We didn't want it to be, you know, if you give us this money, you're part of this program, you get these kind of things, or you get a t-shirt or whatever. We really wanted to challenge people to say, we just need your help, you know? And so what if you were to give and, and, and what you get in return is the fact that we're going to keep doing this important work. Um, and so, uh, we launched that campaign. Uh, people can find that on our website. We also created again, one of these sort of, um, as an innovative concept, this text, the text option. And so we created, if people text the word, well, it's two words, but it's all together. It's help Slack. So H E L P S L A C help Slack that word. And they text it to the phone number three, eight, four, seven, zero. Then they get immediately a text response that gives them the link to go and become the three month supporter. And so not only were we marketing um, that three month supporter campaign on all our platforms, but when we implemented the, the text option, now uh, we've had, you know, over a hundred people do it that way, which is, was actually very illuminating because you're, you're telling people, you know, click this link and donate or text, you know, help Slack to 38470 and to see that a hundred people decided that they prefer to, you know, text than just click a link. That in itself is showing you how technology and innovation is helping in these times. Absolutely. So that's been very exciting, exciting and productive too. Yeah. Yeah. You all have, have pivoted quickly and well. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate you sharing how people can support. And uh Aaron will make sure that that information is is visible for folks. And if you can um, send it to me, I'll make sure it's in the comments and, and awesome. so folks can support. I appreciate you sharing just all the ways in which not only South LA Cafe came to be, that r- helps me understand you more and the, the mission more, but also how you've been able to adapt, right? And that's been something that I've been thinking a lot about is that it's not about figuring out how to do things now in COVID. Of course it is. Uh, or how we're going to do stuff after, but more of like, how can I adapt to what is and how can I remain willing to adapt and not be rigid um, and still find ways to be in alignment with how, with how I want to move. So whether it's in your business and you've given small business owners some really great ideas to think about how you might partner with community and with government um, or in our own house, in our own family, in our own unit. Um, So I appreciate you sharing with us. If folks want to know more about you, South LA Cafe, where should they follow? How would they find you? Yeah, I'm really active over in the South LA Cafe world. So that's where you'll probably find the absolute most up-to-date stuff for me. Um, Honestly, we've created a sort of... um, uh, super tight and mighty crew over on Instagram. So that's our favorite place to be. And our handle is just at South LA Cafe on Instagram as well. Um, our website is uh, southlacafe.com. Uh, and for me uh, personally, uh, again, everything's my name. So just celiawardwallace.com or on Instagram, it's at celia.ward.wallace. Um, if I can just, I, I know I've, I've said a lot, if I could just spend a couple minutes just as we leave, I just feel like I would like to let people know about the relief options that are available to them. Is that is that yeah, okay to please do. speak on? Uh, I'll, I'll move through this really quickly, but I just want to say, since I have been looking into this for myself, I think it's valuable for people who are either solopreneurs um, or have businesses themselves to know that there are the SBA right now has two vehicles that you can apply for. One is the SBA um, a disaster relief loan, which is more of the bigger loan. Like it, it, it would be the one to go for that hopefully would give you as much money as possible that you can, you might be able to get. And yet applying for that, it may take two to three months before you hear back uh, about what you end up getting from them. And yet at the same time, I would encourage you to go ahead and apply. Uh, but they are also offering a 
SBA Relief um, Advance, a $10,000 program where you can apply for up to $10,000. And that is just, um, I just filled it out last night. It's just a three page, you know, very quick um, application process. And from what I'm hearing, unless they get backed up on their time frame, uh, that could be seven to 10 days and you could receive the funds very quickly. And that is an advance that from what I'm understanding right now, potentially could be completely um, uh, forgiven as far as you wouldn't have to pay back. And if you do get the larger loan, uh, it would get it would get bundled into the larger loan. And so I'm really encouraging people to apply for both of those. But in particular, the advanced program right now would be the one that possibly would come very quickly. Um, to, uh, and just two other things to say, there's also... I don't know exactly what they're calling it. It's like the PPP loan. It's it's related to the CARES Act. It's the payroll per protection um, program. They just put it out in the last um, week, and I think it's going live as of tomorrow. Um, but essentially, if you are an employer that had employees on your payroll, uh, there is a program that they're putting out where they're going to give you a loan of up to two and a half times what your average payroll has been for this year. Once you receive that, um, they're saying it needs to be used within eight weeks, which to me sounds ridiculous because a lot of businesses are not going to be doing anything in the next eight weeks. So I'm imagining that they're going to extend it. But presuming you get that loan and you get that two and a half times your payroll, um, they're saying if you use up to 70 Five percent of it towards payroll. That again, that loan may be completely forgivable, uh, or or I don't know if I'm using the right language, but essentially you won't have to pay for it if you show evidence that you used it for payroll. So that's another um, source that's coming out this week that if you can apply for and you're eligible for, you should because it will they'll most likely give you the funds relatively quickly. And it potentially can completely, you won't even have a loan on it as long as you're using it for payroll. Uh, and then the fourth thing I just want to say, I know in Los Angeles, um, and I'm assuming in pretty much all cities and states, um, but in Los Angeles, we do have a micro loan program uh, that the city put out. And, and so look into your city and see if there's any micro loan programs, because here in Los Angeles, they do have a city micro loan program that's up to $20,000. Um, and I think also is something that, um, you know, uh, you know, has very good terms. And so my, my, my um, advice for people who are business owners or entrepreneurs right now is to try to go ahead and apply and get the funding uh, and, you know, really make sure that you can secure the funding that you need to make it through this time and get to the other side. And I think a lot of these vehicles ultimately will be forgiven. And so um, go ahead and try and take advantage of it while they're willing to support. That's great advice. Yeah, that's great advice, not only on the federal level, but suggestions around local. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this. I, I'm gl grateful to see you. I'm grateful um, for the opportunity and for everybody listening in. Um, just know that you're not alone. We're all in this together. If you need anything, um, I'm I'm truly here for you. Uh, most people know, you know, one of my my superpowers is I'm just very accessible and and my my heart is totally open. And so, uh, please don't think that I'm too busy for you. Please find a way to reach out. I'd love to know uh, if if anything that we said today here resonated or supported you in any way. And if you need help, I'm sure that I can help connect you with the people that you need. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining me on Raising Equity. I know I learned a lot and was given hope, even though I'm not a small business owner in the same way as Celia, it made me think about just the importance of, of the narrative of why I do what I do and how I will not only make it through this pandemic, but on the other side, how I plan to live out my purpose. So thanks for joining us on Raising Equity.